All right. I do need. I do have a, an air horn, actually. I should bring it. I mean, just. All right, lay your questions on me. Yes. So for each of the programs that we have for project for assignment of weapons, we have to know the points of every one of them and uh, delete our activity whenever we want. Release? Yeah. Yes. So the the idea behind Assignment 11 is in addition to driving you to the standard library to see some of the functionality that's available there. Uh, the other purpose of it is to give you a, a little bit more exercise dealing with dynamic memory since that's the lingua franca or whatever the pronunciation is of uh, programming is dealing with, with memory. So you're asked to allocate an array of strings uh, using new and therefore good coding practice will have you releasing that memory when you, it's no longer required. But then there's also that uh, comment and Wes had asked about it in, the, in Piazza about this idea of having to null out the pointer. <clears throat> and so let me talk about that a little bit. There have been it, I should have gone back to look for specific examples, but um, I'm going to run with with just making up my own that kind of simulates a generic problem that many of you ex have experienced at one point or another during the semester. All right, so the idea here is I'm going to ask the user, how many times do you want to loop? I get that number from the user, and then I'm going to loop that many times saying hi. And if I compile that, and I run it, and I say I want to do it five times, and it doesn't do it any time. There are other times where you can do it, and probably not going to be able to get this to occur in the wild. Um, where I just say five times and it seems to go on forever. I can simulate that. Let me simulate that. Oops. <laughs> All right. Why is that not doing it? Um, YI is less than... I guess I'd have to do that. So I want to loop loop three times but then it does it far more than three times and let me show what's happening I've actually showed variants of this several times but it's worth doing it just one more time
and Browser. All right. Uh, now I've made this fairly simple, so everyone can pretty much see what's happening here is I've set count to some large number so I've created an integer count and I've set that to some horrendous number and then I've obviously created another variable called count2 and I'm asking the user how many times and I'm actually filling that in account2 so I enter the 5 it goes in there and then this thing's not looping on what I'd entered, but in fact it's looping on a different variable. Um, I'm having a hard time manufacturing this as a, a small short example. But it happens when you write larger code, and it's certainly happened in this class many times, and it happens many times every semester, is you somehow get mixed up and you use the wrong variable. And so the the takeaway from this is the reason this acts so weird is not that you didn't well partially that you did that you asked for count to here and you're not using count to here but the other thing that can make this a really difficult bug to track down in a larger code set is what is inside here and the whole point about what's inside there is well you tell me what is inside there when I create the integer as written on line five Whatever was in there before, right? You have no idea. So what happens is you run this thing 10 times, and half the time 0 will be in there, so this won't loop at all. Half the time some huge number will be in there, and it'll loop thousands and thousands of times. And it's really unpredictable what's going to be happen to be in memory there. It creates really random results, and it's frustrating and, and confusing and so forth. So... One thing that can make, so what makes that bug difficult to find is its unpredictability. And one thing that can make it more predictable and easier to find bugs like that is if you initialize all of your variables to some known value. Now, at least, if this, th now, the way I have it written, it will and, and I, we're actually seeing this in the wild because it just happened that this was using memory that was originally initialized to zero, is this loop will never run. Now, that won't be the desired behavior, but the nice thing is the behavior will be consistent, right? You're not at the mercy at whatever was in memory when you created that integer. So that is uh, kind of a, a generic look at the rationale behind the statement that after you release the memory that you null out the pointer. So what you all have is you have some sort of string pointer and you're, you have a So you're doing that on creation, some time goes by, and then when you're done with it, you need to release that memory. This is what it's asking you to do when it says null out the variable. Now null is just a fancy word for zero. Okay? And what you're doing is you're making that pointer zero. If I don't do that on line 19, then what's inside of ARR? Whatever, whatever was in there before, right? So what I did is on line 15, I created ARR as a string pointer. So here's ARR. And then I'm creating a new array of strings. So somewhere downwind here, I'm creating a whole bunch of strings using new. And whatever this address is, is what is being assigned whatever this address is where all this begins is what is being assigned to ARR. 
So in this case, it would be 1 16. So now when I do this, this does not change ARR. All it does is it tells your program the memory that ARR is pointing to, we can now release. So uh, this memory at 116, this structure, if you will, goes away. Now that memory is freed up to be used by some other part of your program or of the operating system. But the 116 is still in there. So this then leads to the potential of mischief for the exact same reason that I tried to show that there's mischief by not initializing count, which is if you have a bug in your code, at some point you're going to mistakenly try to reuse ARR and you're going to get wacky and consistent behavior depending on the time of day you're running the thing, basically. Uh, but it's a guarantee if you try doing something with ARR when it is zeroed out that your program is going to crash right at that point and what you would do is you'd quickly go to that location you would see that ARR is set to zero and you go aha why is this uninitialized and then you're able to better track down the bug or I should say why is it initialized to zero and you're able to track down the bug so the the generic best practice in programming is to whenever you create a variable initialize it to a known value and whenever you're dealing with pointers, and even right here, when I create it, when I create it, I should set it to, to null as well, uh, particularly because I may not be allocating it right away. I may have 1,000 lines between line 15 and 17. And in those 1,000 lines, have the potential of using ARR by accident. So uh, initialize everything when you create it, and in the case of pointers, if they were pointing to memory when you release that memory, go ahead and reset it, so to speak, reinitialize it to zero. Okay? So that's what it's asking you to do and why you're being asked to do it. Yes? Um, can user input um, change the zero? Uh, for what? This example up here? Yeah, so CN, if that was just a count, would that change? Sure, sure. So I, I, I created, I forced an error here. If I, if I change this to count, then absolutely, that's whatever the user types in is going to fill up count. But um, yeah. But what if you did something like this? Um, so here, here's how about this? Let me let me actually let me make this let me get rid of count two altogether and let me make a, a more realistic example of how this can get screwed up. So I don't go to the trouble of initializing that. So who knows what's in this variable? And I say see out what is your name? And I'm going to create a string. In addition to this, I'm going to create a string s. Trivia. What is in this variable? And I'll ask that. I'm going to get back to that question in a minute. Uh, so I create a string. I ask, what is your name? And I input s. And now I'm going to ask, how many times do you want to loop? And I'm going to get the count. And I'm going to go ahead and loop that many times, right? So... Uh, how about this? Let, let me change it even more. Tell me your name and how many times you want to loop. There we go. So I, then I will do, I'll ask for the name and then the count. And I'm going to loop that many times. All right. So I compile it. Whoops. I've got code where I was doing this. So I'm just going to comment this stuff out. Tell me your name. My name is Todd, and I want to loop five times. Works great. Different user comes along. My name is Todd Gibson, and I want to loop five times. Whoa, what's going on here? Does anyone know what's going on here, incidentally? Huh? So I typed in, here I typed in Todd Gibson 5, 
when I input a string this way, it has the quality of it's going to stop as soon as it finds white space. So it reads in the Todd as soon as it sees the space, it stops reading in. This is going to try and read in an integer, and it sees the G in Gibson, and it vomits because that's not a digit. So count does not get changed in this case. So here's, here's a little bit more subtle error of, of getting random results because you didn't initialize count. Again, with me running it here in front of you, it's just happening that this is being filled with either zero or something less than zero. Um, so I'm not looping any at all. Um, but uh, I wonder if I made this unsigned. Let's see if that creates. No, all right. It, it's 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 hitting memory. That's zero. So yeah, uh, but I won't. I'll leave it like that. So anyway, um, that's a bit of a subtle error, and that's an error in not anticipating what the user is going to type in and not handling that well. Okay, okay. definitely be a hassle to figure out. So there you go. Other questions? Can you show how to uh, use erase and insert? Erase and insert to replace a word in a sentence. So just generally how to replace a word in a sentence? Sure. Uh, how to replace a word in a sentence. So if you use replace in the function, it only allowed the uh, word to be the same size as when it comes in place. And that's a member function of string. Replace portion of string. Yeah, let me look at the usage here. No, they got a bunch of versions of it, don't they? Position length. By new contents, and that's supposed to be str. So, what does it say about? Another string object whose value is copied. All right, so strings.cpp. I'm going to include string. String s, the quick brown fox jump. Jumped over the lazy dog's back. And then I want to create another string called Bobby Teenager. Winter Wonderland. All right, um, then I want to say s.replace. I want to, I get, have to give it a number and a length. So I want to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That would be index 16. Uh, that's fox. And I want to replace that with t. And then I want to say, uh, that says a copy. Well, what does it return? It returns a string. All right, so let me first do um, see out s. Let's see what this does. That may do nothing. The quick brown bobby teenager jumped over the lazy dog's back. Um, so, uh, so that, that, that answers part of your question, is that correct? Yes. All right, so the next question is, uh, what if I don't know that Fox is at the index 16, the 17th location, right? How do I figure that out? So there's a different string command, which is... I think I, I like the fox jumping over Bobby Teenager's back, so let's go for that. Um, I want to replace lazy dog. 
So there's a function called find. And I say what it is I want to find, and it'll give me back the number, the, the location of it. And we, we can test this. So the way you figure this out is this is, this is definitely, if you're not accustomed to looking at this reference documentation, it's definitely a bit hard on the eyes. And sometimes this is always a good place to go is to look at the examples. But even sometimes some of the examples are a little bit of a head scratcher. So what you should do is be writing tests. Let's try this. Let me, let me for the moment comment out this stuff and just say, okay, what if I say s.find the, and I'm going to see that, see out that. All right, we just do a simple test like this. Compile it, run it, the is at zero. Counting starts at zero. Let's just do a quick sanity check. Let's put quick there, and that's the fifth location. Okay, so we're feeling comfortable with how that works. But what if I look for that which doesn't exist in the string? Then what prints out then? Ugh. All right. So that is weird. If the string does not exist in S, it prints out this. Well, what in the world is that number? So now we do have to go back and read a little bit. And if I say not, I look for the word not in here. Not enough. Another string, note, denoted, not one, not, 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 all right, not's not working. So what's another thing I uh, thought it would be found? Found. If no matches were found, here we go. If no matches were found, the function returns this. Now, I don't know what that is. It turns out that that's that, this really weird number, and uh it would be a bit awkward to read this reference documentation and say if no matches were found, the function returns whatever that is, 18 billion, you know, right? So instead, what they do is they come up with this is just, uh, this is like a constant variable. It's a variable, but it's a variable that's not allowed to change. So I can simply use that instead. So now I can do something like this. If I look for the string, in fact, let me do this, size t, how do I know it's size t? I do have to do a little reading and note that it, this, the kind of thing this returns is size t. Probably also see it in the, the example. Uh, here I'm creating a size t variable called found. So size t, location, and then I'm going to say location is equal to s.find and I'm going to find the thing that doesn't exist. And then I'm going to say if location is equal to string colon colon NPOS, which means no position. There's no position in the string where FDSA can be found. See out. Not found. Else, yes, it's right here at index location. Okay, call the find function stored in this variable called location. See if location is equal to string and no position. If it is, say it's not found. However, if the location is not equal to this, then by definition it had to have found it, and we print out this nice message. So let me test that, run it, and it says not found. And I'm going to add an end line here so that it's a little prettier to look at. Not found. Okay, but let's change it now to jumped, which is in there. And to make it clear that it doesn't have to be words, I can say P-E-D-O-V, right, which is this part here, jumped over, P-E-D space O-V. So it doesn't matter whether the string has spaces or not. I run it. <clears throat> now we get back to where we started. 
which was I had hard-coded the location of where I wanted to put Bobby Teenager. What I want Bobby Teenager to replace is Lazy Dog. So what I will do instead is I will say I'll create this and then I will say that um, I'm going to create a size type variable and it'll be called where it's at and that will be equal to our, in the S string I want to find lazy dog if where it's at does not equal string no position then what I want to do is I want to replace and I want to replace where do I want to replace it I want to replace it where it's at and how many is I need to know the length of lazy dog uh, there are a few ways of doing that. There's a, actually, I'll do, give you the C way. You can hard code it in there um, and count on your fingers and go, okay, that's going to be eight. Or this is a C style function from the C string library. Why is it in the C string library? Because the way the C language keeps track of strings is as an array of characters. So this is just an array of characters and it's computing the length there. Uh, I should say here. Um, alternate way, uh, alternate method of computing string length. And in fact, this would be a better way of coding it up, I think. It would be to say that uh, I would say string, new string is lazy, excuse me, um, search string is equal to lazy dog. And if, if the kind of thing is a string, then there's, the string has a member function, which is search string dot size or search string dot length. Both of those are member functions which do the same thing and that gives you how big this is. So I probably would have been better off having created, rather than hard coding lazy dog and find here, I would have been better off uh, creating a, a string, putting lazy dog in a string and then passing the string in there and computing its length rather than using this C function. But if you use a C function, that's fine. Always many ways of doing the same thing. Okay, so let's see if this works. Create a couple strings, see if I can find lazy dog in the first one. If I do find lazy dog in the first one, then I'm going to replace lazy dog with whatever's in T, which is Bobby Teenager. Compile it, run it. The quick brown fox jumped over the, uh, the Bobby Teenager's back. The is awkward, so I'll modify my code here, put the. There we go. Any questions on that? Okay. Now I put a bit of trivia up here. Let me ask about the trivia. Somewhere. Trivia. Trivia. Did I put that in here? Was it in the other file? in the other file. Oh, that's the same one. That was weird. Um, trivia. Trivia. So, let me, let me do my railroad magic here. When I create the count variable, I went ahead and did this and I put the big question mark because we don't know what's in there. Now I'm creating S. So somewhere somewhere I'm going to do something like that. 
And here is my question for you. What is in there? Or here's the main thing. Is it, well, let, let, me just, let me just leave it as a question. What's in there? Yeah? Is it, because you have to include strings, right? So would it be whatever is in the strings in the library? Like, if you're, where is saved at? Uh, you mean when you pound include string? Right. Yeah, so this is, uh, these include statements are, is just information for the compiler. It's saying should you decide to create a string, these are the things you can and can't do with a string. So strictly, you're, you're kind of, you're getting around the edges of the correct answer when you're talking about library and stuff, but the actual include isn't doing anything significant. Right, so so that the key term, the key insight here is that string is not a built-in type of the language like int or float or char. String, uh, string is a class that someone wrote, just like weapon is a class that someone wrote. If you write the class, you have full control on how that's created. Can anyone dig back in the back of their memory and tell me? A legal way for me to create a weapon. Will this work? Will this in your the code you turned in? Will this compile? No, no it won't compile. And why is that? The only way to create a weapon, correct. The only way to create a weapon is to give it three arguments. It's a sword. It has a stamina required of five and a hit chance of three, something like that, yeah? And until you provide it three arguments, you're unable to create it. And so that means that um, the code that you wrote controls how W is initialized. So we actually don't look, don't see the source code for this, but we can actually go to these reference sites and see what happens in a string constructor. So I go back here. Uh, you find the, here's the string type. Here's where it talks about constructors. There are a number of different constructors. The one we're interested in is this one here that doesn't take any arguments. That's what we're doing here. We're creating a string called S that doesn't take any arguments. So that's version one. Version one and constructs an empty string with length of zero characters. So what's interesting is that this isn't random memory sitting here because what happens is the constructor code for S runs and what it does is it makes sure that all of the internal variables are set up properly such that it has a zero length string. And in fact I don't when I stretched S out this far, I really don't know how far out to stretch it because I don't know what all the private data is of S. For all we know, there may be 30 private variables inside of S. But we can rest assured that all those variables will be initialized to some sane and known state. Okay? And so this is a very powerful con uh, concept that when you write a class, you, you not only have uh, control over the usage of it with functions like display or get ID or add exception thing or wield things like that but you also have control over the creation of these things and the only way anyone will be able to create an object of your class is with a constructor that you wrote Other questions? Yes. Um, I can get an error from my code, and it says like a dot out, and then in parentheses there's like a number. And It says it can't allocate. Is that the error? Yeah, I can't allocate region. 
Okay, when you get a can't allocate error, that generally means that there's not enough memory for you to out for your allocation statement to work. And invariably, what that means is you have a runaway loop and you think it's only looping as many times as there are lines in the file, but you've got a bug in that loop, and as a result, it is looping millions and millions and millions of time, and it's just eating up memory one new statement at a time until your whole uh, computer is chock full, and then that's when it crashes. When you try that final allocate statement, it can find no free memory, so then it bails out. And once you bail out, then the operating system reclaims that ton of memory that you ate up. It, you, you can do interesting things, like if you want to make a lot of people mad on Jaguar, uh, what you do is you write a program like that, but there are ways of trapping those errors so your program doesn't end, so you just allocate all the memory, and then once you get that trap, then you just have your program sit back like in an infinite loop, just sitting there. And now you've eaten up all the memory on Jaguar, and when anyone tries to run a program, all their allocations fail, right? Right out of the box. And so they're looking for their infinite loop when there's nothing wrong with their program. Okay. By the time you take you take a bunch of classes from me, I guarantee you, I'll find I'll, you'll know twenty ways of pissing off your coworkers. That's the first one. That one's a freebie. One the one eleven students don't normally get them. The other you see the other section. You want to do this on the other section in two eleven when they're in the class with you. All right. Next question. Yes. In the sum 11, what do you think is the best way to display the time? Uh, in assignment 11, the best way to display the time is to use C time. And C time is a function that harkens back to um, C days, so to speak. It, it's a, it's a, a system call is what it is. Actually, I, I shouldn't quite, it, it isn't entirely accurate to say it's a system call. Uh, there are there are functions. Let me step back even further. So LS is a program that was written by someone. There's an LS.C or an LS.CPP. I'm sure it was written in C. LS.C, and what that does is that uh, interrogates the operating system to find all the files in your directory and list them out. Right? And then it has options that do different things. So in order for you as a programmer, and you can write your own, L, you can sit down right now and write your own version of the LS function, but the big gap in your knowledge is, well, how in the hell do you find out what is in your directory without calling LS? And it turns out that the operating system itself has a, a set of functions to interface with the operating system. So there are function calls for you to interrogate the current directory you're in to get the contents of that directory and loop through them. And they all come in as C style strings. And so you can use that to build your LS program. Okay? So uh, there are a ton of, of operating system functions, hundreds and hundreds of them, for, for interacting directly with the operating system. One level above that is the standard library for C. So the C language was standardized early on, and there are a number of functions that make input and out, for instance, make input and output easier. So there was printf, if you remember that, you give some sort of formatting code, and then you can print out a number. Uh, printf is part, is in the C standard library. And why, why is it that printf is provided to programmers instead of using the operating systems? Uh, facility for printing things out because the operating system's facility for printing things out is very, very primitive. So how do you write out at the, what is the system call for writing something out to the operating system? You say where you write it out, this is a number, which is weird. If it's input, it's zero. If it's output, it's one. If it's error, it's two. And then you can actually create like files would be three, four, five, and so forth. You provide an address in memory and how many bytes you want to write out. So I say, you know, you want, you want address 108 and I want 8 bytes. That'll write out, this memory would be written out to the screen, let's say. But it's not formatted. You're not going to see 116. What you're going to do is you're going to see whatever are in these 
32 bytes and whatever in these 32 bytes. And so very, very primitive. So we get the, this additional library layer to make things easier for us as programmers. Um, when you, uh, when I do a man page, again, in any Linux or Unix operating system, these used to be physical manuals. When I started, the man pages electronically always existed, but they used to also exist as a printed manual. And they're like half size, like a sheet of paper folded in half, so it's about that big in a binder. And they all had sections, and they had tabs dividing them. Uh, you can look at, if you look at these commands, this in parentheses say what tab that would be found under. If it is a 1, it would be something you would type at the bash shell. ls, the cat command, uh, what's something else we do, cd, and that says it's a built-in. There's some built-ins which I want to distinguish between. What is something else that you do? Move, right? All these are in section 1. These are things you type. Then section 2 are the operating system level functions. So when I did read, I have to, you can specify the section. And the reason I'm specifying the section is there's one in section 1. It'll give you the first instance it finds. So read is in section 2 of the manual. These are all operating system calls. The standard C stuff is in section 3. So in section 3 is where the C functions are. So what did I say? Man string length. That's in section 3. So that's part of the C standard library. Uh, and then they go on. Section 4 is... Mm, I don't remember. I think it has something to do with data structures. And there's five. There's a couple that aren't used. One of them is for games, like section seven or eight is for games, where you have the hip happening games of the 1970s on a text console. Um, and anyway, so that's just a little bit of information. It'll be useful to you as you move forward through the program for becoming familiar with what is and isn't. Uh, part of various features of an operating system in your programming. So I, 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 I really rambled there, and I apologize for that. Do you have another question for me? <laughs> Go ahead. I have a similar question to the one I just asked. I get the same type of error, except it says the error for object is usually, I think it's the address of whatever the object is. And it says pointer being free does not have Pointer being free was not allocated. So that means exactly what it says, <clears throat> which is if I do something like um, string, come on, x, and then I say delete x. I never allocated anything to x. So <clears throat> you can also get it if you do this. So let's say I create string x, and then I do x equals new string. Maybe I'll not create 30 of them. So then a little bit later, what I'm going to do later is I'm going to say delete this array that I allocated to x. But then if I do it a second time, I'll probably get that error right here. All right. So it's one of those two scenarios. Either you haven't allocated or you're trying to release it more than once. Other questions? All right. I think uh, you deserve to get your weekend started 60 seconds earlier than you might otherwise. So let me give you the secret word. Yes. So you, the make file is confusing the fact that there are three separate programs? Yeah. Uh, all you have to do, it, you just have three separate make commands. So I, I definitely look back. Um, definitely look back on Wednesday. I think I talked about it. Uh, 
on Wednesday. Look, start there. Have a have a look at this because I talked about it in a fair amount of detail. And if it's still confusing, just uh, shoot something up to Piazza. And today's arcade game. Oh, that's not paged well. Oops. Ah. So it's Battle Zone. It's interesting that there were a few games that used vector graphics instead of just the, the pixels. What is vector graphics? Huh? A vector graphic is a graphic that does not, uh, let me, uh, I'll show you what a vector graphic isn't. If I bring up, um, well, I don't have time to bring it up. You know, if you take an image and you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in and it gets pixelated, okay, that is not a vector graphic. A vector graphic is uh, something that does not lose its specificity specificity. So if you had like a letter of the alphabet that was with vector graphics, you could zoom in as far as you wanted in that curve on the A or whatever would be just as sharp as when you're pulled way out. Yeah, so vector, vector graphics describe something in terms of arcs and fills and things like that, whereas the things that get pixelated are just described in terms of pixels and colors. So 